Welcome back to theater at Motlow College. I'd like to apologize in advance for how long this lecture is going to be. Um, design is an entire uh, vocation for um, so many of the, my friends and I want to make sure that I do it right and my friends who are technicians as well so I want to try to give dignity to this huge and vast uh, topic that is ever-changing so I apologize in advance for how long this is going to take. <laughs> um, first of all when you go to see your live theater production there's a good chance that the design or the theatrical elements uh, that the backstage is working furiously to accomplish you may not even notice and that is one of the kind of cruelties of efficiency you know when you're watching an Olympian and you watch them dive and you think the first time you see an Olympic dive you go wow that's amazing and then by the time uh, you know you're five minutes in you're like uh oh she didn't point her toes and it looks so easy <laughs> well great artistry um, looks easy it looks effortless they can make um, a well seamless beautiful theatrical design um, that's naturalistic particularly may not be even one that you pay much attention to and that means that they've done their job well particularly your light board operators your stage managers your stage hands if all goes as planned you may not notice them and in that case don't feel a need to put it into your paper because they've done their job well. If they mess up, you'll be the first to know. Uh, another kind of disclaimer for today's lecture is that we'll go through a whole list of specialties, but <laughs> In the end, theater is a group effort and a team effort. I've been an actress who helps people change clothes, uh, which would technically make me a dresser. <laughs> I've been a um, designer who did makeup and wigs during the run of the show. Uh, a lot of hands go through a theater production. Just because it's not in your contract or your job description doesn't mean in a theater setting that you're not going to be um, doing lots and lots of work. So I wanted to start with Joe Turner's Come and Gone, since it's kind of fresh in your mind as a script. Um, and if you are designing the set design, which is the setting, well, what you see when the curtain opens for uh, Joe Turner's Come and Gone production, um, you might see something like this. This is a rendering from uh, the Eugene O'Neill Theater. And you can see some of the things are just necessary for what the script calls for. We've got a door on the far left there. You can see the door um, that the people will come in and out of. On the far right bottom corner, you can see um, the door down into what is presumably kind of like a basement or a storm shelter. That's probably where Zonia played, right? Uh, or on the bottom left-hand corner, we've got kind of a little garden area. That's probably where um, we have the sacrificing of pigeons. Obviously, that table center stage is where the majority of the action goes on. And uh, on the stage on the right, you can see a sort of living room area, something a little more comfortable for people to cozy up in. So some of what you have to do as a designer, as it says on page 92, is to start with what is the script demand. If the script demands a door, then you probably need to put a door into the design, right? If um, there's an offhanded comment, oh, what a stunning dress you're wearing oh well we can't put her in pants for that scene because the um, script says that that's what they're wearing so when you are as a designer when you initially read the script you need to look for what are the bare bones what are the requirements now here we have um, not the rendering but the realized set you can see some of those details like the light fixture um, uh, one thing I thought was interesting between the initial design at the Eugene O'Neill and the actual realization, you can see the smokestacks up top, which we talked about in the Joe Turner's Come and Gone lecture, the importance of the fact that they were all um, working in factories and how big that was as a theme. And it looks like um, that came out for the set designer of Joe Turner's Come and Gone as, as well, which I thought was kind of cool. It's also, if you look at the majority of the stage, it's realistic. I'm assuming that that um, 
little corner in the back left hand is a sink that probably actually works if we look on the on the um, on the right hand side that's probably where she's making biscuits right we've got a very naturalistic realistic kind of um, setting going on here with cups and plates and probably real biscuits pretty free food yay for actors um, but then up top that sort of um, skyline there is something more metaphoric which we'll talk about today it's not like that's actually the view out the window it's just something that your set designer wants you to be aware of at all times that these people are headed straight to the mill right they're headed to their factory jobs so the next thing that you need to look at is what if this is a realistic play and it's set in a historical context what were people wearing right what were people um, what kind of houses were people living in if you're doing the set design um, you know what sort of uh, is the reality of the times is, is the water coming in in a bucket or is it coming through a spigot those sort of um, factual details need to be researched uh, so obviously this is Maddie not Molly right Molly wears bright colors Molly wears flashy garments this is oh worn out Maddie <laughs> she's got uh, heavy textures thick flannels but still some delicate lace so what does that say about Maddie's psychology as a um, feminine woman but also a sort of bedraggled and worn out woman so uh, costume can hint at the historical context but it can also um, it can also kind of be indicative or you know what we wear says something about us right I, I wear a lot of cotton because uh, I don't like to have things dry cleaned that means I'm lazy <laughs> it also means that I um, don't necessarily live on the finer side of life you're not gonna find a lot of silk in my closet because I'm um, pretty basic and when it comes to my clothes uh, so you know what kind of textures do you see for the psychology of that character also in Joe Turner's come and gone you need to think about the practical or anytime you're designing you need to think about the practical implications right um, Joe Turner uh, sorry not Joe Turner um, Loomis is there on the right in that baggy baggy coat well logistically we have to create differentiation of characters so we've got several African-American men around the same age hanging out in one household. It would be easy to get them confused. And especially with your star character, there's a reason that a woman wears white on her wedding day. We're going to make her the focus of the day. And if you're a woman, you know, I better not wear white to this other woman's wedding because it's her day. She needs to be the one that stands out. Um, and so when the focus is supposed to be on Harold Loomis, we're going to put him in this baggy trench coat because nobody else um, should be co confused with Harold Loomis. So you can see these other characters here. Jeremy um, is belted, and that was within the style, but it also just helps distinguish the guy in the baggy clothes. The um, person wandering is Harold Loomis, and everybody else is wearing that work belt, right? Another thing that you know uh, I really like about this costume design is it did end up looking very ecumenical he does have a sense of mystery the man in black the man um, in the big black trench coat uh, but he also looks religious which we learn by the end of the play he is a very religious character and I would say if I were looking for an adjective as they say on page 92 when we get into a design process we start pulling out these adjectives what are some adjectives that would to describe Joe Turner's come and gone and I think mystical mysterious or spiritual would definitely be one of those adjectives to describe that particular play maybe earthy earth tones real grit and drama uh, those are some adjectives so when you get into designing a show 
and the director sits down at the first um, meeting with the designers well before an actor is ever cast or invited into the process these designers sit in a room they exchange pictures they exchange research and they come up with these words that sort of in power or um, in uh, ignite their imagination and those words as they say on page 92 in the second column those words sort of um, guide everybody on to the same page now we can have all this high-mindedness we can have all of this beautiful inspiration um, and it creates a comprehensive design and uh, not just one costume at a time. I'm not just going to sit down if I'm designing this is Wicked, which is um, a, a, a prequel to The Wizard of Oz, where we have Elphaba, the, the Lady in the Green. Um, she's the Wicked Witch of the West uh, with Glinda, the Lady in the Blue, played by Kristen Chenoweth. Um, you know, they go in the same world. Even though they're these polar opposites, they still are within the realm of this earthy almost steampunk sort of world you can see even though it's all earthy Glinda is the sky in the earth right she um, is sort of the stars and the the lightness uh, whereas I think Elphaba is a heavier character the winged monkey he's not bright red coat bright red pillbox hat uh, he is a more earthy um, so they all need to kind of look like they go together or they're in the same world that's always a goal of a um, of a design is to sort of me create this comprehensive reality unfortunately <laughs> That doesn't always happen. This is a horribly funny website if you ever want to check it out. I think it's Low Budget Beasts at Tumblr. Um, you need to make sure that whatever you can imagine, you can also have the funds to create. I just feel so sorry for this guy on the left. That is bright green tape holding his mic in place. That's just sad. That's so sad and I know these are theaters who want to bring the Beauty and the Beast to um, everybody but you shouldn't do a show unless you have the funds to make it happen so this summer you may see a really a show that was written to just show off how much money that theater had such as Shrek Shrek is a show with so many different costumes uh, obviously Beauty and the Beast so many different costumes and resources required but if you don't have the budget to make it happen pick a different show people oh I can't stay on that too long uh, now here is uh, Wizard of Oz is done by Motlow College and this was a technical rehearsal so they don't have makeup on yet so forgive us for that but you can see that's a very um, much like the movie interpretation of the little toy with the little symbols and the little pillbox hat now we if we had done a children's show live and brought this monkey with his gnarly hair and sunken eyes and you can't see it but he has gnarly skin too the children probably would have run from the theater in terror so once again who's your audience and when we're interpreting the script for children these sweet little monkeys are much less intimidating and actually scary uh, you know we want to scare the kids but we don't want to overwhelmingly scare the kids so um, a lot of you as a designer is just looking at what the script says and as it says on page uh, 94 you know if you're doing waiting for Godot and it just says a tree well what kind of tree the set designer here Kurt Krauss he obviously in the wooded forest that they walked down the yellow brick road he imagined this gnarly trees these trees that are um, sort of feel like they're gonna reach out and grab you at any moment because they do right in the Wizard of Oz so it's your job to interpret what kind of tree is that um, what how old is the person in the script is it daytime is it nighttime it may say there's a moon is it a full moon or is it a crescent moon so these are the kind of visionary elements that a designer has to decide on so your job <laughs> is written in the there's a written description but just let me really quickly say is to create a rendering so you saw in that video that I 
output um, what a rendering is. A rendering is a drawing and then you create the reality from the drawing. So when I sat down to draw out this munchkin for uh, Debbie Zimmerman, she was describing to me what she wanted. She wanted puffy sleeves and a big collar and um, this all of my little notes on my rendering are just to facilitate the conversation between Debbie Zimmerman and her stitcher. Right? That's the only reason why I created this rendering. Obviously, it is not art. <laughs> so when you sit down to do your project and you draw out a design for me, um, feel free to add little colors or, um, or little um, notes such as should we find a pattern for the polka dots or do we need to sew on each individual polka dot. Uh, obviously there we found a pattern which is why we went with blue instead of purple. Um, so it's sort of and she did have gloves in the real picture thing I think uh, but it kind of is just a picture is worth a you know a million words it's so invaluable when you're trying to convey something to someone so that's really the goal you, I want you to draw that rendering you can use a croquis which means that you just trace the bodily form but make sure to erase you know if you're gonna do a skirt for example I don't want to see the individual legs so trace in pencil erase the legs where the skirt would go that kind of thing um, and then describe to me who are your influences a big influence for this munchkin was how the Grinch Stole Christmas, right? Um, that aesthetic that Dr. Seuss created. We wanted that kind of crazy. But obviously the hair is also influenced by the uh, original Wizard of Oz movie. So um, in any uh, different picture, I'm not as interested in you being a perfect artist. I'm more interested in your creativity and your thought process. So in order to give you um, some background on the history of the Wizard of Oz, this should help you um, get your juices going. You can pick any character from the Wizard of Oz. It can be one from the original Baum book, such as the China Doll, or it can be one from the movie, uh, The Wizard of Oz or The Wiz, which we'll get into in just a moment. It, it was called The Great American Fairy Tale, and it was originally written in the way of the Grimm's Brothers fairy tales, right? It's supposed to have this epic, um, timeless idea to it. It was an allegory. Now an allegory means that each character is representative of something. And uh, Frank Baum was writing this as a political allegory. Uh, at that time they were trying to decide on a political issue and that was the gold standard as the basis for the US dollar rather than silver. If you can remember in the original um, Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is wearing silver shoes and um, they are the thing that lead her home. So obviously if you want to know spoiler alert where ba Baum stood on the issue he was very much for silver shoes. Um, now this was all representative of different kinds of Americans so obviously Dorothy is an all-American girl she's from uh, middle America uh, she's from Kansas uh, the scarecrow there was representative of the farmers the farmers were hard-working people but they didn't necessarily always think smart when it came to being politically active, right? Um, so it was sort of Baum's critique of the farmer, of, of the scarecrow, is that they weren't thinking enough. Now the Tin Man, as you know, as we talked about um, with Joe Turner's Come and Gone, this was the industrial age and we had lots of businessmen, but they lacked heart. They were imposing horrible, um, you know, conditions on their workers, they would do anything for a buck, and they have no heart. These uh, tin woodsmen, this, um, this silver guy has no heart. Uh, now the lion is supposed to be representative and, and is a long-standing representative of the political parties. Uh, the politicians in power. They know what's going on, they have heart, but they're not brave enough to intercede on behalf of the people. So that's just sort of a, um, and then obviously the Wicked Witch of the West and the East, um, you know, the different sides of the country, there was a lot of um, gold in the West, which is why sort of this, obviously Frank Baum's on the side of the silver. Uh, so it was a political allegory. 
Now, you have probably enjoyed The Wizard of Oz for years and years and not known anything about this allegory, and that is the beauty of fairy tale and um, epic storytelling. It doesn't have to mean what it means what it originally meant anymore. So you can take it or leave it. Take that allegory and run with it in your design or forget all about it and just enjoy uh, these myth mythical characters. Um, so they were going to Oz, which is the abbreviation for ounce. And this land of Oz is green, which obviously stands for money. Um, this great American musical, 1939, is... Uh, very different from Baum's book. If you read the original novel, uh, it's much scarier. It's much more gothic and cryptic, um, I think. Uh, not that The Wizard of Oz didn't scare me to death when I was little. Those winged monkeys, oh my goodness. Um, it's almost, everyone agrees, The Wizard of Oz is an amazing movie. It was a huge triumph in its time with the special effects, which is one of the reasons that I uh, bring it to the limelight when we're talking about technical theater. There's a musical version of this that gets played out on the stage uh, consistently and uh, is a wonderful, wonderful musical. Uh, the, the version that we did here at Motlow was just no music. It was just the story based on the bomb book. Uh, in 1978, we have the great American um, fairy tale retold through the eyes of African Americans and created a beautiful musical called The Wiz. You can see uh, Michael Jackson there on the far right as the Scarecrow. Uh, just an absolutely phenomenal movie if you've never seen it, which is a musical that is still performed today. That's uh, in the bottom there. I When I taught high school, I was one of a couple teachers who taught theater and I did the costume design for this show uh, which is The Wiz at Hattiesburg High School in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. So what are some differences between The Wizard of Oz and The Wiz? How did the African American experience inform or change or alter this great American folktale? Um, well initially in The Wizard of Oz we have a Kansas tornado but in the movie um, version of The Wiz we have a Harlem snowstorm right because there if you've ever been to Kansas uh, it is not a very ethnically diverse area right so what is the epicenter of um, jazz and blues and African-American culture is Harlem so that's a very natural place for to s create this initial setting um, so in the munchkins they have we represent the lollipop guild right and uh, at that time it was less offensive I would say it was still offensive to um, hire these little people to represent um, munchkins uh, I think that the whiz did a great um, rewrite there we are not going to uh, you know create a stereotype or build upon a disability and create some sort of um, mythical character that they will undoubtedly be teased on for the rest of their life we're just going to create street kids right kids on the street um, you know uh, with the, they're running around as children rather than these miniature people so in the Wizard of Oz we have a tin woodsman in the um, Oz in the Wiz the movie version we have circus equipment and that was a really cool kind of um, old rusted uh, he goes to this amusement park with old rusted um, roller coasters and obviously that's not what they did for the Wiz the musical the stage version because you can see there he looks exactly like a tin woodsman but that was a really cool deviation for the movie um, <laughs> there's a scene in the Wizard of Oz when they go into a poppy field and everybody gets really tired and they fall asleep in the poppy field you may remember that well, many modern audiences wouldn't get that reference. It was actually an opium reference. It was a reference to drugs, uh, which the Wiz um, then brought out with the Red Light District. 
<laughs> which I'm, I'm, not, I'm your teacher, but I'm not going to teach you too much. Uh, the monkeys in The Wizard of Oz had those fez hats and vests, and the flying mo monkeys in The Wiz have motorcycles. So you can just kind of see these cool ways that they updated. So um, they took uh, a very specific world and uh, updated The Wizard of Oz. So uh, we call that fracturing a fairy tale. So I'm asking you to take that same fairy tale, think about putting it in a different genre. Maybe you really like science fiction. You may want to go on Netflix and look up a movie called The Tin Man, which has Zoe Deschanel as Dorothy. Really interesting science fiction version of The Wizard of Oz. Um, maybe you want to push the fantasy to extreme and make a really beautiful character out of one of these witches. Maybe you want to take one of these witches and set them in their a different country. What does a witch look like in a different country? Any of these are great um, beginning places for your design. Okay, so moving past The Wizard of Oz, I'll use lots of pictures today from The Wizard of Oz, um, but moving more specifically into the different areas of design. The first one we're going to look at is scenery. On page 95 we start. Um, scenery is when the curtain comes up, everything that's on the stage mostly besides props and people obviously but the the windows or the doors or the um, in this situation it would be that hanging uh, drop behind them and the piece of furniture wheeled in there uh, historically there hasn't been much scenic design uh, there you know maybe a door an Asian theater there's still not a lot of scenic design but in the Jacobean theater uh, in the uh, 16th century they started having these really ornate um, sort of many dramas that had very beautiful exquisite you can see Leonardo da Vinci even designed these court mask um, beautifully painted uh, representations of say the ocean or the starry night and uh, many of them used a, what's called a forced perspective which I have a um, backdrop here which was in our Wizard of Oz which was meant to you know when he goes to Oz and there's the talking mask this is sort of the hall they have to walk down and it has that forced perspective if you've taken an art class you had to learn all about this it's um, it helps create a sense of dimensionality it helps create um, not just a flat image but a 3d a sense that makes it look more real obviously to our modern eye this still looks very um, representational nobody's gonna look at that and go wow can I actually walk down that hall no we know it's representational but in that age it was pretty cutting-edge and um, beautiful poor little Toto down there looking at the whiz oh such strife <laughs> um, so uh, flats were commonly used uh, they um, are basically a wood frame with canvas stretched over it so if you've ever seen like a piece of art on a canvas it's just a really large one of those if you're an actor or you've ever acted in a play with flats you probably stubbed your toe on one of those braces there it's very frustrating <laughs> um, but sometimes they're just painted sheets which are called drops you can see the winky town back there munchkin land whichever it is those are drops they're just painted to represent the scenery and um, <laughs> you can see our munchkins walked on their knees in order to look smaller uh, I don't know what Lance is doing as the lion there he's just being silly um, this is still in the rehearsal process so it's not the finished product it's just a action shot um, so we uh, used to have this representation of reality right we kind of talked about representation versus presentationalism this is um, you know we're presenting reality um, but now in the 1920s particularly in the 1930s we start having a metaphoric scene, scene design and that is to sort of um, what is the script getting at because we have more poetic theater coming out this is Our Town which is a very um, famous Thornton Wilder play 
and uh, Thornton Wilder wrote it without a lot of scenery and he did that on purpose he didn't want the scenery getting in the way or to be what it's about he wanted it to be about the poetry and this is about the girl next door you can see the boy on the left and the girl on the right and their ladders and they're meant to be representative of looking out their windows at the moon and you can see and you can imagine people looking at each other um, out their windows even without the window frames of the whole house structure now I'm the one uh, on the far right of the three ladies in the back there we're talking about how it's potato weather for sure enjoying the moonlight um, and this metaphoric design um, is more bare bones uh, he has in on page 30 96 here he talks about how um, um, Elizabethan theater you know when he comes out for Henry V and he apologizes you know we're not going to have a full battle here oh sorry no that's on page 98 um, it's an unworthy scaffold to represent the battle um, he's not going to have an entire cannons and everybody carrying weapons it's just sort of to represent and even though it did happen uh, back in Shakespeare's time it was more intentional um, at the turn of the century or into the 20s and as I said Eugene O'Neill wanted to highlight the script so you'll you may go see a play where they um, you know are standing on a box and that's meant to represent a ship and maybe they all lean and um, they make it seem as if they were on a ship but they're not actually on a ship and you, there's not a lot on stage to represent that would be a metaphoric scene design so when you go in to evaluate um, the play or judge the play you may want to ask is this representational or is it more metaphoric is it meant to just insinuate is that something intentionally that the author did or that the designer did in order to hint at a reality rather than fully represent it a scrim is something that stage designers use uh, probably the most uh, famous uh, scene in modern times with it's always done with the scrim is from Chicago uh, they had it come in the cell blank cell block tango and there's different women dancing in shadow a scrim when lit from the front is just white and it is uh, you know just a white sheet looking but then when it's backlit it's transparent so this can make the transitions of scenes very effective it's commonly used if for example um, you were going to give a prologue or something and they're kind of acting it out in the background as the narrator talks a lot of Shakespeare plays they put you know the battle behind the scrim so it's more forgiving and uh, not the full focus so if you see that and you want to talk comment on it in your um, in, as you write your paper that's called a scrim it's transparent when you light it from the back but it is um, if you light it from the front you don't see through it um, so a lot of state scenery is valued for its ability to not hurt people right canvas flats have um, been used for years and years in the theater because they're lightweight and if they fall over uh, for any reason it's just canvas it's not gonna really hurt anybody well maybe those two by fours will they're also cheap muslin you can buy which is what a canvas uh, is made of is muslin it's a form of cotton that's lightweight it's very breathable it's very cheap and it's stretched across some scrap lumber which is um, you know not as costly as building a wall out of bricks we can just stretch some canvas over the frame paint it to look like bricks and that uh, is a lot cheaper for us um, it's very uh, theatrical it's very old-fashioned to have these um, flats but they they all work just fine they will work just fine okay another commonly used element in the theater is a drapery you can see in the background there 
Oh, this picture is kind of dark. You can't see it as well. I should have lightened it up a little bit. Um, but you can see the curtains. Uh, there's several legs of curtains. So um, people enter from the legs. They stand behind the legs so that you can't see them to listen for their cue. Then we, of course, have the first, the very front orchestra curtain, the big curtain that opens at the beginning. And uh, at Motlow Main Stage, we also have uh, the orchestra curtain, which is halfway back that we can close all the way. Way. Um, but then we also have those legs that people can hide behind. And this is once again in an opera house. This is traditional opera house has all of this drapery. Not all theaters have all this drapery, depending on what kind of theater they are. So a turntable. Uh, these are usually powered uh, by a pneumatic device, which is an air uh, device, and it turns when you... Um, when you power that air underneath it. This is made famous recently by Les Mis in the 80s. A lot of productions of Les Mis are still going to try to have a turntable um, simply because marching is such a big um, sort of design element of the show that these these French um, rebels are marching into the opposition and knowing that they're going to die and that they're going to fail. Uh, so that sense of marching is enabled by this turntable. Um, so you may see uh, that if you go to see a show like Les Mis, but you also may see a turntable in, as a device to change the scenery. So if I stick a piece of uh, a flat in the middle of that and then on one side is one scene, a uh, piece of scenery and then on the other side is another scenery, um, it's a quick way for that turntable to rotate and then change the scenery rather than having six people scramble on stage and move everything around. The toggle bar on the canvas flat, you know, you can just have a stage hand grab that toggle and, and walk it off stage because once again a flat is very light. So these are all just sort of some of the tricks of the trade, some of the tools of the trade that we utilize when we're creating scene design. And I just want you to have a language for it when you um, come to uh, write your, your critique. A platform, I did not include a picture of that because hopefully you know what a platform is, um, but uh, many stages will have series of platforms as kind of their um, basis for stage design as well. More and more theaters are using light as scenery because it's cheaper than woodworking. <laughs> so you can see here that those aren't actual trees projected onto the wall. Um, it's just a shadow trick. It's a gobo. It's a light trick to represent a tree. I've been, seen some beautiful uh, ways of utilizing this. In fact, when I was in our town by Thornton Wilder, they projected a um, stained glass, beautiful stained glass on the floor to represent the fact that I was in a church and I was crying because my daughter was getting married. And it was a very sentimental scene and it had that warm glow that many beautiful older churches have. And it was just a beautiful choice on the part of the design team. I don't know whether to give the set designer or the lighting designer credit for that because once again, it's all a group effort. It's all a group effort. And the worlds mix. So, historically, we have something called the Deus Ex Machina, which was to fly in the gods. So, we know all the way back to the ancient Grecians, we had machines that could lift people up and help them to swing across the stage and make it look as if they were flying, right? And the ancient Grecian plays, they were the gods, um, you know, Obviously, Peter Pan, Mary Poppins, uh, there are plays that demand these flying machines. When we did The Wizard of Oz, our flying monkeys did not fly. Alas, alack. But this is Wicked, and Wicked was funded by Universal Studios in order to keep up with Disney. <laughs> so Wicked is well-funded, and every sense of the budget was unlimited. I can't even imagine how fun it would be to work with an unlimited budget. So, heck, they don't have three little monkeys. They got 20 monkeys and they all fly. It's wonderful. A beautiful scene if you've ever seen Wicked Live. It's such a hauntingly uh, 
exciting scene when all these monkeys start to fly in and Elphaba is giving them their marching orders. Um, so, uh, moving on away from uh, stage machinery into sound. We're on page 103. Now, obviously, it was the actor's responsibility to speak loud enough, and at the beginning, we didn't have as much attention paid to um, sound. Uh, it, it's also kind of partially, we talk about kind of how everything is molding over from different areas. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we're not doing sound, we're doing lighting. <laughs> I need to slow down. All right, so moving on to page 111. Um, as I was just saying, you know, the, the crossover between what is the lights, what is the scenery, uh, who gets credit for what, well, it's all just a big uh, time when we're all working together. And this is Olivia. She was running that light board. You can see she has her finger on the dimmer switch. She can pull it all the way up. The lights get brighter. She pulls it down. The lights get darker. Now she's working from um, a script, old school style, so she has to listen for the cue and when she hears it she'll tr dim down the lights as the transitions happen. Um, we also have a computer there that she could program in the cues and press a button and it would automatically take from one cue uh, to the next. Um, historically, uh, of course, the first um, stage lighting was the sun. <laughs> and um, it's interesting that Aeschylus in his play Agamemnon, he starts at sunrise and the watchman is standing on the top of that, um, he's usually standing on top of either a roof or a facade of some kind and he's watching the sunrise and he watches the ships come in. And uh, we believe that Aeschylus staged it that way because they started their theater festival with the rise of the sun. So it's kind of a clever way to incorporate what was happening with the way, um, what was happening in the story to what was happening in real life. So um, obviously the theater is the seeing place, so you have to be able to see. <laughs> um, when we look at what is light's purpose, it's often to sort of highlight uh, different people. Now we want to obviously see everybody but some people are more important in a scene than other people. So we have that um, historically they talk about in the medieval outdoor drama they used to hold up pieces of tin to sort of reflect the sunlight onto Jesus or his disciples and give him extra light. Um, in the 1800s we have the li limelight I'm sorry, the 1900s, 1820 is when it first started with the limelight. You can see these practitioners up above the um, stage and they have this on the far left you can see this sort of machine when two people are handling it in order to create that limelight, that sweet spot uh, for an actor to stand. It's always an actor's responsibility to find their light. You should be able to feel the light on you and um, it helps create focus which is really one of the major goals is visibility and focus. So you can see all the townspeople in Wicked down here in their costumes but they're not the main event when Glinda comes in. When Glinda flies in on her bubble machine the main event is Glinda the Good Witch, right? So we want to have a spotlight on her so that as she sings that's where people are looking. And we'll talk more about focus when we talk about directors. A couple other ideas that really should matter to a lighting designer is verisimilitude. And that is naturalness. Naturalness. So where is the light source? As you're watching a scene, is there a window in that scene? Well, appropriate to the time of day, can they make it look like moonlight? Because believe it or not, that's actually a lot harder than you would think to create a light source to come through the window and splash on her face like that and look naturally like moonlight. It's actually pretty difficult. Uh, it takes multiple instruments. Another thing you should be asking yourself is how does this set the mood, right? We look at this glass menagerie scene on the left and uh, 
you should have a sense of bow chicka wow wow which is what is going on with the candlelight right and um, a good lighting designer is sensitive to the atmosphere or the mood that's trying to be created right and candlelight is a traditional way to create and set the mood so what are some of the tricks of the trade? What are some of the things that people craft? Well, one of them is a gobo, and it creates those shadows. You can see those stars on the wall. It's a little metal frame that you slide in front of that instrument there, and it casts shadows um, to look like trees or lights or whatever. So if you see that in a play, you want to represent that by calling it a gobo. Another sort of, of the nuts and bolts of a lighting designer is plotting out the instrumentation. You can only use as many light fixtures and plug them in to the amount of wattage that you have. If you have too many lighting instruments plugged in, um, you can blow a circuit and then the lights will go out during your show, <sighs> right? If you don't plan it out and do your math and uh, I'm never going to be a good lighting designer because it you have to climb up high and I, I don't. <laughs> we had a an old ladder in my undergrad that I climbed up on many times in order to complete my practicums and my internships, but whew, I am not good with heights, so I ask you in your initial um, getting to know you question, you know, which element do you think you could do? Well, if you're good with math and you're good with heights, you might be a good lighting designer or a lighting technician, but I am good with neither. So, uh, like I said, uh, Olivia was working from a prompt book, so she would look at when does the light need to change, when does the sound effect need to come on, and she would press the respective buttons or the respective dimmers according to the time in the script. This is one of the reasons as an actor it's so important not to mess up your lines, not to skip your lines. Because if I as an actor drop a monologue or skip ahead in my scene, I might throw off the prompt book. I might throw off um, the technicians who are running my scene. Um, so down here in the bottom left hand corner we have an ellipsoidal. Um, that is a instrument that can throw light over a long distance and that's useful if you look in the back of a theater you're probably going to see one of these ellipsoidals uh, commonly either called ERS's or LECO's you'll hear them called that as well each one of these is worth about four hundred dollars so you see an average of probably eight or ten on the back of most theaters that's one of the secrets of the theater is how expensive that lighting equipment is um, but this can throw light a far way which is why the ellipsoidals are so valuable they can they can light from far back and light more of the stage uh, if you have um, a lamp in front of you, you can kind of look, you know, what's the wattage on that um, bulb? Is it is it high, uh, is it, you know, a really bright bulb or is it a dim bulb? An ERS is a, is a very bright bulb. Okay, the next uh, term that we have here is Fresnel, and it's named after the shapes. You see those circles on the outside there? Um, that's what is called the Fresnel. That's what makes it a Fresnel. Uh, these are really old school. You don't see as many Fresnels as you used to. Of course, we still have some at Motlow, but... Um, uh, you can see there the hardware too. Uh, many of these uh, you can either hang them with a C clamp on the ceiling or you can use them as a spotlight on a stand. So um, you can see those barn door clips around the edge. Those are the f that holds a frame that can either have that gobo that I just showed you or gels, which we're going to talk about next. And there's a good old parkan. If you go to a concert and you uh, have, maybe it's an outdoor concert, and you can easily look at the tree lighting and you'll see those cheap little parkans. Basically, it's just a light bulb in a can. And it's um, used several of them to light any one spot on stage because they're not as high powered as the ERSs. You can see that parkan on the left there has a gel in front of it to stay 
light on the right. That's my student, Zan, when I taught high school being silly. He was my wonderful stage manager, and we'll talk about what a stage manager does in just a moment. But up above, it shows a pretty good... Um, uh, clear kind of depiction of gels and what they do. Um, they create light and this was from The Wiz so it was a very um, rock and roll kind of aesthetic for the lights so they're bright colors so you can see like there's the orange gels in the back and the pink gels in the middle and then the yellow gels in the front and that was in order to create a rock star, star aesthetic as different scenes were going on it was very brightly lit. So a gel is just a piece of plastic that you put in front of um, um, a parkan or an uh, ERS or ellipsoidal, whatever you have, a Fresnel, that gel kind of goes in front. Now a lot of the more modern um, theaters are switching to intelligent lighting and if you look up and back at at the lights in the theater as you're watching the show, you might see a series of little bulbs that look almost like a um, a nightlight that I used to play with when I was little. It's just got like little tiny bulbs and they are intelligent lights so I can press a button and change from blue to yellow and uh, it's digitalized rather than this plastic uh, that kind of goes in front is called a gel so um, depending on the budget of your theater you may have you may see gels in front of the park hands or you may see um, something more sophisticated uh, so the fly system you can see this fly system is very uh, bare bones it's not a very high ceiling and it's held on the battens those long bars are just held on <laughs> uh, with chains it's, it's not a very intricate um, at Motlow, we actually have a pretty good fly system. All of those Wizard of Oz drops that you saw, they are stored up in the ceiling above, and that bar is lowered by a levee and comes down. Um, and the fly system is called a fly system because things can fly in and out. So when the lighting designer lowers that batten, um, they can C-clamp those instruments and then raise it back up but like I said don't tell me that you want to be a lighting designer if you're if you're afraid of heights because you have to climb on an old wobbly ladder in order to get up there with a light instrument with gloves on and, and adjust it so that it's pointing in the right direction uh, you know I could point the light in any direction so we want to make sure to create those pockets of light on stage create those focus spots for different moments in the script according to your instrumentation so um, uh, fly systems use uh, pulleys and levers, the traditional opera house style. But of course there are electric ones nowadays. So just something to think about. Um, obviously the fly system also affects um, the scenery as well. That's what the drops hang off of those long steel poles there called battens. If you are ever in a theater and you hear heads, that doesn't mean look up. That means uh, cover your head because something um, may have slipped off of a batten, whether it's a frame of a gel or, God forbid, a whole instrument of a uh, lighting instrument. Hope I just saved somebody's life. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay, moving on from lighting into my wheelhouse, which is pretty costumes. This is a play I did called Tecumseh, which is an outdoor um theater you can see that Native American girl in the back that was you know that was one of my little bit parts there um, that's not me but that's what I would have been doing on stage and this was what's called the stag dance and uh, in this moment as it's acted out an actor takes a wolf skin and sticks it on their head and they act out the hunt and then another series of actors put stags or um, or deer heads on top of their head and they act out the hunt and we can imagine that this happened in every major culture because when you're telling a story you tend towards theatricality you might put on a voice you might you know um, create some sort of rudimentary costume those cow heads that they're wearing there those are the shaman and those are traditional uh, Native American shaman costume is, is those bones. So 
you can see that costuming is not just something that is uh, done with sequins and sparkles, although that's my favorite kind. It's also something that priests wore, shaman wore, to set themselves apart. Uh, you know, I go to a church where the minister wears a collar, and for different times of year, he wears different colors to signify and remind us of the Christian calendar. But this happens um, in every major religion. If we look at the Greek theater, uh, they the robes that the that the uh, original Thespis who stepped out from the chorus would have worn in order to set himself apart. They were all had their origin in this sort of religious religious ritual, which is very similar to makeup as well. We'll talk about that in just a moment. The use of makeup and divination. Um, so the purpose of a costume is to set the actor apart. When I did The Wiz, this was our tornado. The dancers had a very expressive lyrical dance and those, um, you know, things hanging down from their arms are meant to symbolize the tornado. But if you saw someone walking down the road, <laughs> just chilling out in a lycra, full body, glittery spandex, you'd probably look twice. You'd probably be like, well, huh? Uh, what are you doing? <laughs> People don't usually wear dance costumes as they're walking down the road. Um, the purpose of a costume initially in the first, um, up until about Shakespeare's time, was to set the the actor apart from the audience. If you went to go see a Greek play, the people on the stage would look very, very different from the people in the audience. Now, you may go see a naturalistic play in which the people on stage are just wearing regular clothes, right? But historically, the purpose of a costume was to set the actor apart. Now, around the 1800s, um, we had a movement towards realism. And the purpose of that was to... Um, create historically exactly what they would have worn. So for example, when they're doing Julius Caesar, they would wear togas. We don't have a lot of evidence that Shakespeare, when he depicted Julius Caesar, he actually put anybody in a toga. That's not in the stage directions anywhere. But in uh, around, you know, 1750s, they started putting people in the clothes that, that actually would have been worn in that time. And once again, that's as we're moving towards an enlightenment where we're observing a scientific reality in order using theater as a way of education and understanding ourselves. So that realistic historical accuracy was something that started to come in vogue and has continued to be so. If you go see a show like The Crucible, uh, they're going to go to great efforts to make sure that everything on stage looks, you know, they've got corsets, we've got uh, pilgrim hats, we've got everything looks exactly how it would in the show. Um, now, on the left, I have a Baum illustration there, uh, Frank Baum, who did the original Wizard of Oz, and you can see all of those pointy pilgrim hats. Now, uh, in the movie, they just had the pointy hat for um, the Wicked Witch, but you can see there Glinda the Good, she has a pointy hat as well, and that's partially because those were just in vogue. If you look on the right, Pilgrims all the time wearing pointy hats. They look goofy to us, or specifically Wicked Witch to us, but they were part of the style, right? So, this is the Wiz when I costumed it at Hattiesburg High. Um, what we wear affects our psychology, right? What we wear affects our psychology, and the costumes and how we wear them. Um, helps us to act a certain way. I don't know if, um, you know, if Dorothy, when she puts on the dress, Aisha, who played um, Dorothy, you know, she was a, she's really a tomboy. And uh, when I told her I was putting her in a dress, she kind of looked at me sideways. And I, you know, <laughs> we negotiated about the length and such. Uh, but when she got in that dress and when she got in those heels, she started to move, um, in a way that uh, was very feminine and, you know, I think it genuinely changed her behavior based on, you know, putting on heels and a skirt changed her behavior. And uh, I, you know, Chelsea there is, is playing one of the witches and uh, you can see that she's really funky and uh, offbeat. Well, the character is really funky and offbeat. And if I had put her in the big sparkly gown, uh, then it would not have been um, 
true to the character. So the clothes we wear kind of affects the way that we feel about ourselves. I would challenge you anytime you go to a job interview or something important, um, you know, wear hard soled shoes, wear shoes that make you stand up straight and feel confident, um, put on a tie, you know, dress uh, for the best possible scenario, dress for the job you want, because it really does affect the way that you feel and your confidence level. If you have an ironed shirt on, there's a better chance that you're going to sit in a way that's poised and confident in that role. Whereas if you um, are slouchy and your clothes are wrinkled, you may feel yourself um, less presentable. Uh, so you can see in the background there the um, the uh, spray paint art that is done by an actual um, gang member uh, when I was working at Hattiesburg High he he did that in several places around town you could see his artistry <laughs> uh, but he also worked on the set of the Wiz for us <laughs> oh well um, so costume materials, what fabrics you use really affects the original outcome. Now Dorothy is supposed to be of low means. She's supposed to be a, from a poor neighborhood and that's part of the reason she's so in, you know, overcome by Oz. Uh, and so we've got just a simple cotton gingham, very all-American fabric and very traditional for Dorothy. Um, you can see that the lion, we went to great expense to make sure that he was fuzzy and furry and inviting, right? So that when the children came up to him after the show, they wanted to hug him. And uh, obviously, the Tin Man, we couldn't actually put him and forge a tin suit. That wouldn't be comfortable. It would be highly unsafe. Um, but we still wanted that reflective quality. So he's wearing a lame there that catches the light, and you can tell by the costuming material um, what it's meant to represent. And now the gatekeeper on the far right there, she's wearing lots of sequins because she's meant to represent this luscious, luxurious, wealthy uh, town. So what kind of fabrics you use? And in the theater, of course, we're always poor, so we always have to use the cheat, right? You can use actual silk, um, or you can use a silk substitute that looks just maybe not quite as good, but from a distance, nobody can tell the difference, right? That's not actual fur, that's faux fur. So um, you can sometimes find things that look more, you know, luxurious than they actually are. Um, so moving on at a breakneck speed, um, symbolism in makeup. So makeup historically has been just as sacred as um, costume. If you look at something like Katakali in India, the um, process of applying the makeup in order to um, represent one of the Hindu gods, it is a sacred ritual that takes a lot of time. It can take um, half the day to apply that sacred um, makeup and they do believe that the the spirits are inhabiting them as they put on that makeup and um, Japan which is what this um, makeup is uh, right here we would maybe associate red with the devil or something evil but red in their culture actually represents a hero so as soon as they see that red um, on stage they're gonna know that guy is the hero right? That guy. The same is true, of course, of Native American clans. They had their favorite, um, not clans, tribes. Uh, they had their favorite colors. <laughs> this is kind of a mix up there because obviously the Scottish people had their um, clans and their different plaids as costumes that would set them apart. Um, but traditionally, when you see a certain makeup on stage in an Asian culture, it often automatically hints at who the character is. Just as soon as you see somebody with red face paint, that means they're the hero. So, um, so there's a great deal of symbolism, and we'll go into that more when we go talk about the traditions of the East and the traditions of the West. Um, but makeup uh, can mean different things. This is, of course, from The Wiz. Uh, on the far left here, we have a woman. She's 
a dancer in the show, a student in the show, and she just has on traditional beauty makeup, makeup to bring about different features of her face that she wants to highlight. Obviously, she has bright red lipstick on. That is going to help define the feature of her smile as she's dancing. Uh, all of that beautiful eye makeup will bring out her eyes, her beautiful green eyes, while she is on stage. So that's just a simple beauty makeup and you'll see a lot of women on the stage wear lots of beauty makeup in order to define now depending on the size of the space Hattiesburg High had a pretty big theater so we put on a lot of makeup but if you're going to see a small show they may not need to cake on the makeup as well so when you're watching your show if it's a small seat uh, seated theater and they don't have on a lot of makeup that's okay but if you go to see something at um, the Von Braun Civic Center or at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center they probably need to have on a lot of makeup in order to define their face from far away so you can see in the middle here we have a character creation for the tin man I had to use prosthetics that chin strap there is held on um, with a spirit gum it's glued to his face and praise Jesus it never came off while he was on stage um, but if you're watching a show and a prosthetic starts to fall off uh, it is a process right getting a mustache to stick or getting uh, a prosthetic to stay on a face um, can be tricky business so that's something to watch for um, but of course it can add a lot to the show that little jaw you know breaks up his face and makes it seem more um, less you know like just a regular human being and more like a tin man um, sorry for the bad resolution here but I just wanted to point out uh, that you know makeup can also be indicative of personality right you can't see it that well but she's got on black lipstick and heavy eyebrows and she's the wicked witch and so she's bossing everybody around in her factory and that sense of harsh makeup helps tell us the story so if you go to see a children's play particularly you may see um, makeup that helps tell the story Okay, breakneck speed. I didn't say anything about wigs, but of course that's a huge element in the theater. So moving on to sound design. We are on page, sorry I didn't put the page number there, page 133. Um, so sound design uh, traditionally in the theater um, there were some tricks, but it was often just an actor having to project their own voice. Obviously, Aristotle highly valued sound. He made it one of his six elements. Inside of the Grecian masks, there were megaphones, which would help project the actor's voice. So we have some rudimentary sound design. If you go to see... Um, uh, you know, a musical, you might see recent innovations, such as a mic attached to their face. Uh, you know, when I was doing a lot of musicals they were hidden they were small but now it seems like um, you know I'm seeing a lot of very visible mics we're kind of just accepting the fact the rock star aesthetic of seeing the, the mic um, it might serve as an amplifier to alter the actor's voice obviously uh, it may serve to amplify the music some instruments are naturally not as loud as others Right, so if you are a person who can listen to music and kind of set the levels and balance it out, you might be a great sound designer. Um, you know, often the drums, if you're playing like a rock and roll band, the drum kit is going to be the loudest thing and you're going to have to measure kind of everything else um, according to how loud your drummer is, right? Um, sound effects, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And we call it canned music often if it's pre-recorded. Uh, this is what we often have to do at Motlow is use pre-recorded music. Um, unless it's a full-out musical and we hire a band. But it can be stylized or like in the case of Alice in Wonderland when she falls down the rabbit hole, you know, had an echo effect on it so that it would sound, you know, she says, I'm nothing but a pack of cards. You're nothing but a pack of cards. It had that echo in it to make it sound like she was falling down a tunnel. Um, or it can be realistic sounding. So if you go to see a musical, pay special attention to how the band sounds. Is it a even mix? Um, are they with the singers? Are they um, 
is it a full bodied sound? Is it got, uh, you know, a full kit, full instruments, or is it just a piano and people singing, you know, depending on their budget, it may have different things. Um, sound effects are traditionally part of the theater even back into Shakespeare's day they would use what's called a thunder sheet there you can see that big piece of metal they'd shake it and it just sounds like thunder um, you would have found those in most theaters to create particularly those scenes where there's a sense of foreboding storm coming a, you know a play like the tempest which is named for its storm it would have had a, a foreboding kind of um, scenes where they wanted that sound of thunder um, but just in many other sound effects you can imagine such as wooden blocks for um, horses coming in um, you know a bell to signify a doorbell ringing uh, a lot of those sound effects you can have live and in many cases if I'm staging a production I'll actually prefer to do live sound effects because canned sound effects, recorded sound effects can sometimes sound hokey or cheesy, uh, whereas if they're actually happening in the moment, they sound more naturalistic. Um, but obviously there's other purposes for um, sound. There can be an underscore of music. There, You may hear music before the show starts called pre-show music that helps set the mood. So pay attention when you go to see a play. What do you hear? Uh, do you hear birds chirping? The sound uh, that stage man that a sound designer has wants you to know that you're outside you know typical movie if you hear this the uh, construction you know you're in New York City because that's just like every sound designers um, indicator that they're in New York <laughs> So a stage manager, this is one of the most overlooked and most vital roles in the theater. And it's um, it's the person who kind of puts it all together. I know we're skipping over a lot here. I'm not going to talk about puppets. Um, I'll talk about puppets a little bit next class, actually. But um, to, um, moving over into different roles, different productions, different things you might see in your um, program as you're you know watching the show that you might say I don't even know what that is a stage manager a production stage manager is basically the director's right hand man or woman they um, enforce things like um, union codes so if you have a good stage manager she will tell the director okay the actors have been on their feet for two hours now it's time for them to take a break and um, you know she would announce to the cast during rehearsal okay time to take five and we have five minutes to sit down and get our water and relax before we have to get back up on our feet again uh, a good stage manager during the run of the rehearsals um, she you know if somebody is late she'll call and see where they are um, she takes notes to tell the production staff and the design staff so for example if we're rehearsing Othello and we have a handkerchief that they talk about in the script she may write a message to the props um, designer and say okay we talked about it today and we want to make sure that the um, handkerchief is exactly 12 inches um, square because she uses it for this and that and that's the size we want so she would pass that message she's kind of the designer's eyes and ears during the rehearsal during the run of the show the stage manager is in charge the production stage manager is the one who um, calls the show on that headset. She tells the lighting designer, uh, sorry, the light board operator when to pull the lights up. She tells the um, stage hands, okay, time to run on and grab that and carry it off stage. Everybody that has a heads headset is listening to the stage manager. Um, you might be a good stage manager if you're bossy, but people don't resent you. <laughs> if you have administrative gifts, we'll say it that, that way. Um, but you can do that in a way that's kind and you know that people um, follow where you lead. Um, stage managers are often assertive and um, organized. They have to be really well organized and they have to have a good sense of timing. If you go to a show and there's a lot of pauses, um, you know, the actors are standing on stage waiting for the lights to go out, you may have a stage manager who's not too good at their job because a good stage manager pays attention to those cues and picks up the cues. Um, stage manager is one of the better paid jobs in theater because they have a lot of responsibility. So if money is something that matters to you, um, you might want to be a stage manager. 
there's me. <laughs> uh, I think it's kind of generous to call my sewing skills a specialty, but I have been a stitcher on many a show. I can sew a button on with the best of them or put together a pattern if you give it to me. Um, but there's all of this list of specialties here on page 147. Um, and so if you look at a, a program and you say, wait, what does a first hand do? Um, right they work with the cutter it's, they all have kind of technical names because what they do is very specific and they work you know half of their life to be a good draper or to be a good master electrician um, but uh, there's no need for me to sit and go over all of these specialist jobs and titles I just want you to know that there are a ton of artisans in any theater event especially a Broadway event that you go to there are three times as many people behind the scenes uh, one person that I do want to point out is the technical director and that's the person who is head over the scene shop and they make sure that all of the construction and the budgeting uh, goes on time and there's a lot of woodworking involved and it is um, very complex so a technical director um, if you see them on a playbill, um, you know, they're kind of, this technical director is pretty well paid too. So if you have some woodworking skills, that might be a good job for you as technical director. If you have a good sense of budgeting and construction, it is a, um, most our school doesn't have one yet, but a lot of universities have technical directors because it is a full-time job. Um, Luckily, we have some really talented um, artistic staff that that help and volunteer with uh, some of them get paid at Motlow, but um, particularly in the maintenance department, a lot of our maintenance at the main campus are willing to help us build things and have woodworking skills. So we're very lucky in that way. Um, but a shop foreman, a scenery supervisor, these people have woodworking skills. So if that's something that you can do, maybe that's the job that you would put um, as the job that you could do in the stage. Um, you know, maybe you're good with wigs, maybe you're good with makeup, maybe you kind of have a history in cosmetology, that might be your specialty. But whew, once again, I apologize that this is such a long lecture, but it's really such a broad sweeping thing. Technical, theater, design, people who run the show, people who prepare the show. It is a huge element of any stage, which hopefully you saw that a little bit in that documentary that you watched at the beginning of the season. Um, so get to designing, get to thinking about which roles you would play if you were involved um, backstage for any reason. As always, thank you for listening.